I am Stephen Pittam and I chair the steering group of the York Human Rights City Network. And I want to offer a very warm welcome to everyone to our annual York Human Rights City Lecture for 2022. And we are delighted that so many people from York, from other parts of the UK, and even from other countries have registered to hear Baroness Lister address us this evening. Over 300 people have registered to be with us. So we're really pleased with that. It's my pleasure to introduce the proceedings for tonight. First, I want to thank our co-host of tonight's lecture. The Joseph Roundtree Foundation is an anchor institution in our city of York, as well as being a national independent social change organization working to solve UK poverty. Baroness Lister has been a consistent ally for the Foundation in the House of Lords in pursuit of this goal. We are pleased to be co-hosting this lecture with the JRF. Once again, we are organizing the lecture as part of the university's open lecture series. We are grateful to the university and events and the AV teams for promoting the lecture, organizing the bookings and organizing the AV and sorting out our problem eventually this, this evening. And whilst I'm offering thanks, I would particularly like to mention Jenny Manning, who is signing a, for us tonight. The York Human Rights City Network came together about 10 years ago to explore how we could make human rights feel real at a local level. We recognize that the policy frameworks for human rights are set at an international and national levels, and yet it's at the local level that human rights become most relevant to citizens. The network is jointly hosted by York CBS, which roots us in York's vibrant civil society, and the Center for Applied Human Rights at the University of York, which roots us in the human rights discourse. Five years ago, in 2017, in April of that year, the Lord Mayor of York, in the role of first citizen of York, signed a declaration making York the UK's first human rights city, with the full support of all the political parties in the city. Through so doing, York joined six other European cities which are now recognized as human rights cities and many more worldwide. This is a growing movement and we're delighted that in the last year, Swansea has declared its intention of joining York in becoming a human rights city. We hold this lecture every year to mark the anniversary of signing the declaration. A declaration in which the city embraced a vision of a vibrant, diverse, fair and safe community built on the foundation of universal human rights. The declaration marked an ambition. It was a significant point in a journey and not a final destination. We know we have a long way to go to achieve our vision. Each year, we put together an indicator report to show how we are progressing. We asked the people of York online and on the streets what they considered to be the five human, key human rights for the city. And we adopted the top five that they chose. And they are the right to equality and non-discrimination, to housing, to education, to health and social care, and to a decent standard of living. All of these rights relate to tonight's topic, but perhaps the decent standard of living one in particular. 
The results of our 2021 indicator report show worrying trends in our city, an increased child poverty, and an almost 20% increase in demand at York Food Bank, and in an 11% increase in the wage gap between those earning average wages and those on low wages. This is a wake up call for all of us who are concerned about the human rights of a decent standard of living. There is an urgency to the situation we are in. Um, Ruth Lister uh, was working at the Child Poverty Action Group and for, became the director um, thereof um, before uh, entering the House of Lords. And I think as you will have read in the uh, um, material for this lecture, um, Ruth was the author of a major work on poverty uh, called Poverty, which was published first in 2004. It was deemed to be uh, the, the definitive book at the time on poverty. Um, and more recently, she has updated that book um, and has uh, in included um, areas of, of work which are in line with, with how we are thinking about poverty in the York Human Rights City Network. Uh, in terms of thinking more about human rights, about agency, um, and about citizenship. Um, so um, I'm really sorry that Paul, who <laughs> had prepared the introduction, um, has obviously uh, dropped off the call. Um, but Ruth, we hope that you are still with us, uh, despite all the problems. And I'm going to invite you um, to, to give your address. Thank you very much indeed, Ruth. Okay, thank, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and I hope the gremlins won't get me. I think we seem to be a bit fated this evening, but uh, if they do, I might just go um, anonymous and stop my video, and that might make things better. But anyway, fingers crossed. So, good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for the invitation to contribute to this year's lecture. Uh, in focusing on poverty from a human rights perspective, I want to talk about the ways in which some poverty activists are deploying a discourse of human rights, not as a narrow legal or academic concept, but as a vibrant language of social justice aimed at achieving change. In the words of a group of uh, grassroots activists without academic or legal backgrounds, we're talking in part about people in poverty claiming the right to talk about rights. The de deployment of a human rights perspective on poverty is needless to say challenging in the UK context, especially given a Westminster government who is no friend of human rights, and of course we're now faced with the so-called Bill of Rights. It's thus particularly pleasing to be asked to give this lecture, albeit virtually, in a human rights city, and I hadn't realised the first human rights city, um, with a human rights city network and where the people of York have, as Stephen has already said, identified a decent standard of living as a priority right. So I'll start with a brief account of how a human rights approach has been deployed internationally for discussing the ways in which human rights is offering a way of thinking about, talking about, and mobilizing against poverty, and of articulating concrete demands. I'll finish with a brief assessment of the value of this human rights discourse to anti-poverty politics. A Joseph Rowntree Foundation study of how human rights have been used internationally to shape new conceptions of poverty, new approaches to combating it, points to evidence that human rights have been used to challenge the effects of regressive welfare reform and the language of personal responsibility that underpins it. This is especially true in the US, where one activist explained that for the past decade, I've been part of a growing domestic human rights movement, fueled in no small measure by the work of anti-poverty activists determined to challenge fundamental misconceptions about people living in poverty and about poverty itself, and to do so by communicating and carrying out their work in terms of human rights. 
This emergent human rights movement, it's been argued, represents a powerful new politics of social justice, which has included groups arguing for women's rights as human rights. In Europe, the language of indivisible human rights underpins the anti-poverty strategy propounded by the European Anti-Poverty Network. And organizations such as Oxfam and ATD Fourth World, the human rights organization working with people in persistent poverty, have been instrumental in translating human rights approaches from a, de a development to a domestic context. According to human rights activists, a human rights-based approach uh, is based on two key premises. First, that all people have human rights. And secondly, that for each right, there is a corresponding duty on states to respect, protect, and fulfill these rights. In this way, a human rights-based approach views human rights as having an important role to play in governing relations between those with greater and lesser power in a democracy. Amartya Sen, who has been instrumental in the UN's adoption of a human rights-based approach to poverty, suggests that human rights are best understood as a set of ethical claims rather than a narrow legalistic term, in narrow, narrow legalistic terms. These claims stem from recognition of the inherent dignity and equal worth of human beings which stands in contrast to what is all too often experienced as the dehumanization of people in poverty. To quote ATD poverty activists, we are neither recognized nor treated as human beings and the stereotyping of all poor people dehumanizes them in the eyes of others. And this was a message I failed to really hear in the past which very much influenced my thinking in writing the second edition of my book on the concept of poverty mentioned by Stephen. It made me receptive to the argument of some human rights theorists that we should be placing as much emphasis on the human as on the rights in human rights. As the founder of ATD Fourth World reminded us, when we speak of human rights, we often forget that fighting for human rights means fighting for the right to be human. The emergence of a human rights discourse around poverty can be interpreted as contributing to what has been called a new poverty knowledge or counter narrative, which counters the dominant narrative and the dehumanization and othering of people in poverty. Human rights with their foundational commitment to the recognition of human dignity and flourishing offer a way of thinking about poverty that goes beyond the material to embrace the psychosocial and the relational. The material is, of course, the material is, of course, still crucially important. It is, after all, inadequate incomes and living standards which serve to define poverty, and which measures of poverty typically attempt to capture. But the experience of poverty is about more than this. It's not just a disadvantaged and insecure economic condition, but also a shameful social relation, corrosive of human dignity and flourishing, which is experienced in interactions with the wider society and the way people in poverty are talked about and treated by politicians, officials, professionals, the media, and sometimes I fear academics. It's been suggested that one way of thinking about rights is that they construct relationships, relationships of power, responsibility, and accountability. In other words, that they are tools for giving expression to the types of relationships between individuals and groups that we value. In this way, they help to counteract poverty as a shameful social relation and to challenge the power imbalance that shapes this social relation. The relational dimension of poverty has emerged in particular through participatory action research. This has highlighted the psychological pain all too often associated with poverty, disrespect, humiliation, and an assault on dignity and self-esteem, shame and stigma, and also powerlessness and lack of voice. These stem in part from a process of othering, 
by which people in poverty are treated as other, i.e. different and inferior to the rest of us. It's a process of differentiation and demarcation by which social distance in the sociological sense uh, of the term is established and maintained. Mark Steele describes the process of othering in his study of Australian poverty. To treat poor people so harshly, you have to see them as unlike you in a very fundamental way. In the UK, a common refrain is as a group of low income parents tell the parliamentary group, the worst thing about living in poverty is the way, way it gives others permission to treat you as if you don't matter. The Commission on Poverty, Participation and Power, of which more in a moment, observed that the lack of respect for people living in poverty was one of the clearest and most heartfelt messages which came across to us as a commission. Across national research in seven countries conducted by Robert Walker and colleagues demonstrates the debilitating effects of the shame associated with poverty and the stigma that can be imposed through the receipt of benefits. Earlier, when people living in poverty were asked their views on UN draft guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights, the demand for equal dignity was central to their vision of how to combat poverty. ATD activist Marianne Broxton elaborated on the implications of adopting a dignity lens to understanding poverty in a statement to this year's UN Commission on Social Development. She explained it means rights for all, together with, among other things, acknowledged voice, personal agency, being identified as you want to be seen. And dignity, dignity cannot, she made clear, be just the latest buzzword. Understood in this way, I argue in the book that the politics of poverty is transformed into, poli into a politics of recognition and respect as well as a more traditional politics of redistribution. The process of othering is aggravated when poverty interacts with social divisions such as gender, race, stroke, ethnicity, and disability, the importance of which has been underlined by the Equality and Human Rights Commission. But another important dimension of a human rights conceptualization is that it builds in the principle of non-discrimination. Advocates of a human rights approach also advance a broader argument that human rights invite analysis of the structural causes of poverty rather than only its symptoms. To quote Peter Townsend, the language of rights shifts the focus of debate from the personal failures of the poor to the failures of macroeconomic structures and policies of nation states and, and international bodies, and we could add local authorities insofar as they have power. By focusing on the structural causes of poverty and the responsibilities of the state, advocates underline the potential for human rights to challenge unequal power relationships and recast the relationship between people experiencing poverty and the state by enabling them to hold the state accountable. In the words of a former Secretary General of Amnesty International, Framing poverty in human rights terms provides an empowering framework for rights holders, people living in poverty, and an accountability framework for duty holders, those who exercise power over poor people to respect and protect rights. This empowering framework addresses the powerlessness felt by many people living in poverty, both by strengthening their sense of themselves as active agents and by curbing the power exercised over them by the state and others. How people understand their situation shapes their response to it. The use of human rights by anti-poverty activists has been described as an affirmative communication strategy designed not just to change perceptions of poverty and of people living in poverty, but also to mobilize them to act. It does so in at least two interrelated ways, by strengthening political agency and by counteracting the shame of poverty, thereby making it easier to develop a collective identity associated with being poor. 
I argue in my book that a structural analysis does not mean we should ignore the agency of people living in poverty and treat them as passive objects, because to do so contributes to the process of othering, be it malign or benign. Even though their lives are heavily constrained by their socioeconomic circumstances, they still can and do make choices and act as agents in their own lives. This may be simply a matter of getting by on an everyday level, which can involve considerable skill and creativity. And uh, I just note on that the MP who suggests that we just need to teach people in poverty how to cook and everything will be all right, might uh, look at the, the evidence on that. Um, but, uh, or it may be, uh, involve attempts to get out of poverty or to affect political change, either as individuals or collectively. The JRF evaluation of the use of human rights in anti-poverty action reports that interviewees said human rights can give people living in poverty a sense of self in relation to the state and a belief that they are worthy of investment. A sense of self is crucial to the, to the development of political agency. Indeed, a key gain identified by their study is the heightened political agency of those experiencing poverty with implications for power relationships. By challenging dominant representations of poverty, the human rights discourse also makes it easier to accept the label of poverty. A number of British studies have found a reluctance to do so. Research by a former PhD student of mine, Jan Flaherty, suggests that this in part reflects an absolutist understanding of poverty associated with very poor countries. But this absolutist understanding was one of a number of mechanisms she found people use to deflect the label of poverty from themselves. And it's likely that this process of deflection is in part at least due to the stigma still associated with poverty. Acceptance of the label in turn makes it easier to identify with others living in poverty and thereby develop the collective identity necessary for effective political agency. The human rights discourse offers people in poverty an alternative, more affirming discourse than dominant discourses, which are, as I've said, often demeaning and disrespectful. It's as if the language of human rights is here being used to counter the negative associations that identifying as poor typically provokes. Proud to be poor is not a banner under which many people want to march. But marching under the banner of human rights makes it easier to stand up and be counted as poor, as has happened in the US. This aspect of, hum of human rights mobilizing against uh, of human rights is mobilizing power is illustrated by an American anti-poverty rights activist recalling a pivotal moment when homeless people were forcibly evicted from their camp during freezing weather. She reflects that night, none of us knew what human rights meant, but we had one thing in common. We felt less than human beings. We began to use the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in our everyday organizing to counter the denial and shame of being poor. The language of human rights counters the process of othering because it's about what we share and have in common as human beings rather than about what separates us. American researchers refer to the potential of human rights to restore to US social justice work a sense of the underlying commonality of simply being human that is often lost to all of its divisions by identity, geography, issue area, and belief. This goes to the heart of the idea of human rights, namely, as I've said, respect for the fundamental dignity of all human beings, regardless of difference. And this is so important when many people living in poverty feel that they, they are denied this respect. As one woman, one woman said in a study in which I was involved, poverty strips your dignity. You can't have any dignity with poverty. And it can be the everyday indignities 
that make poverty so difficult to bear. Turning to social and economic rights, although they are sometimes characterized as passive welfare in political debate, not least in the UK, human rights activists do not see them in this way. If respect for the dignity of all is one key tenet of, key tenet of the human rights approach to poverty, the other is the indivisibility or interdependence of the different forms of rights, a principle which is, in, which is enshrined in the UK International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Moreover, human rights activists argue that rights have to be claimed and that they construct people in poverty as legitimate claimants of entitlements from an accountable state rather than as recipients of straight state largesse whose needs are defined by others. Indeed, Walker and colleagues warn on the basis of their cross-national research that social security systems that fail to promote personal dignity risk eroding <clears throat> individual agency and the ability of people to help themselves. Their study also provides um, pointers to policy. And I turn now to the ways in which human rights has provided a way of articulating concrete demands, albeit at times implicitly. Walker and colleagues call for a shift from shame inducing to dignity promoting anti-poverty policies. This they suggest requires uh, reframing policy discourses as well as the design of policies. And they argue it points to more universal rather than selective forms of support, as on the one side means testing can harm dignity um, and social solidarity, and on the other more universal benefits and services speak to our common membership of society and shared and equal citizenship. They are also more effective in preventing as opposed to merely alleviating poverty and in providing genuine security of immense importance to people whose lives are marked by such endemic insecurity. This message has taken on increased resonance during the pandemic, which is documented by the COVID Realities Project, partly based in the University of York, has exposed the inability of the social security system to provide comprehensive and adequate protection and security, even if universal credit cope well with the massive increase in claimants. I'm focusing on social security because of the central role it plays in the lives of people in poverty and its status as a human right. Indeed, international human rights law recognizes social security's central importance in guaranteeing human dignity. And the ILO has developed this approach. But of course, any anti-poverty strategy, which we don't have in uh, Westminster level, any anti-poverty strategy has to include other policy areas, including employment, education, childcare, housing, and health and social care. Scotland stands out for its adoption of legislation that explicitly acknowledges that social security is a human right, essential to the realization of other rights, and that to quote, respect for the dignity of individuals is to be at the heart of the Scottish social security system. Ruth Patrick of York University and Mark Simpson suggest three interlinked dimensions through which a social security system can achieve the principle of dignity, namely distributional, relational, and intrinsic. The distributional dimension means that benefit levels should be sufficient to allow life in dignity and decency, as enunciated in various conventions, declarations, and treaties. Adequacy is central to the principles set out by the Commission on Social Security, led by experts with experience. Of course, it begs the question of how we measure such a level, though the JRF minimum income standard derived from discussions with members of the public, does provide a pointer. Their research indicated that members of the general public subscribe to a minimum which allows for sufficient resources to participate in society and to maintain human dignity. In other words, it implicitly endorsed a human rights standard. 
the, the welcome, albeit temporary, 20 pounds uplift to universal credit during the pandemic represented a tacit admission that universal credit is simply too low. A range of research indicates that the pandemic has been particularly tough for families of children for whom there was no additional social security support and who've suffered most from punitive measures such as the two child limit and the benefit cap, which have been criticized from a human rights and children's rights perspective. Now, of course, social security claimants have to face the cost of living crisis identified by Just Fair as a human rights issue, as well um, on benefits that have been uprated by a mere 3.1%, well below half the current level of inflation. As participants in the COVID realities project warned, there is nothing left to cut back. The relational dimension of dig a dignity promoting system speaks to the need to address the ways in which the delivery of benefits and also services all too often is shame inducing and dehumanizing. It points to the adoption of a human rights culture premised on respect for the human dignity and equal citizenship of service users. Experience suggests such a culture can transform the relationship between people in poverty and the state, central and local, which by and large looms larger in the life of people living in poverty than the rest of the population. As one researcher has argued, treating user groups and individual clients as a legitimate source of welfare wisdom and incorporating their views is essential. This leads into the third intrinsic dimension identified by Patrick and Simpson, which they link to individuals' sense of self-worth. According to the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, meaningful and effective and genuine, genuinely empowering participation can build self-respect and self-confidence and gain the respect of others through recognition as a human being. Participation is theorized as central to a human rights based approach because it underpins the effective realization of other rights. It acknowledges the agency of rights bearers and their potential to play a role in the de development of rights and services. In strengthening that agency, it enables people with experience of poverty to act more effectively as democratic citizens and bearers of human rights. This has implications too for human rights organizations themselves, community researchers in the Social Rights Alliance have argued recently. The right of participation represents an important means of recognizing the dignity of people living in poverty, because it's saying that their voices count, that they have something important to contribute. It acknowledges the validity and value of the expertise born of experience which can itself represent a form of power. So the establishment of a Poverty Truth Commission in York, led by community com commissioners with lived experience of poverty is thus very welcome. The Independent Commission on Poverty Participation and Power, which I mentioned earlier, established to explore the barriers to effective participation, was constituted with half of its members the direct experience of poverty, and I was privileged to be a member. Anger at lack of respect, as, uh, as noted earlier, and lack of voice were key intertwined messages that we received. We also learned that people experiencing poverty see consultation without commitment and phony participation without power to bring about change as the ultimate disrespect. The point echoed in the network's latest report on human rights in York. In Scotland, participation has played an important role in the development of the devolved social security system, reflecting another principle enunciated by the Commission on Social Security. The key conclusion drawn by JRF is that to design a social security system that truly acts as an anchor in turbulent times, we must work directly with those experiencing the system and reflect their experiences back through compassionate and just design. And I welcome JRS support for groups such as Poverty to Solutions, who are led by people with experience of poverty. 
The intrinsic dimension can be strengthened through training of professionals and officials designed to achieve an understanding of what poverty means and of the crucial importance of respectful treatment of people living in poverty. And this is enhanced by the involvement of people with experience of poverty in that training. To sum up, I've offered an optimistic account of a human rights based approach to poverty on the basis that it offers an inclusive way of thinking and talking about and mobilizing against poverty. In the words of the American Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, his message is one that demands power, not pity. It also offers a set of principles for formulating concrete demands through what I've suggested represents a politics of recognition and respect, as well as of redistribution. However, I've also acknowledged the difficulties of a human rights approach, especially in the current UK context, and have suggested that a greater emphasis on the human in human rights might help counteract some of the resistance among some politicians and others who see it as un unduly adversarial and legalistic. But that is not to suggest we should not be promoting the importance of social and economic human rights in any anti-poverty strategy, not least because it covers the rights of non-citizens such as asylum seekers and those subject to the no recourse to public funds rule. Some commentators have also pointed to the danger of human rights being co-opted as part of a more managerialistic approach. This is always a danger, but I'd argue it doesn't detract from the potential significance of the emancipatory ethos of human rights as a mobilizing force. This is brought out by an unpublished evaluation of a poverty and human rights project conducted by the British Institute of Human Rights. It observed the transformative effects of involvement in the project. A form of alchemy took place. People's lives and their view of themselves were transformed. The project built the confidence and self-esteem of rights holders. This demonstrates they will write what is at the heart of a human rights-based approach. People seeing themselves, often for the first time, as human beings who are worth something just by dint of being human and who are entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. So in conclusion, I'd like to recite a truly inspirational poem published anonymously that I've discovered was written by the late Moray and Roberts, who was an extraordinary activist with ATD Fourth World. And indeed the second edition of my book is in part dedicated to her. And some of you may have heard me uh, recite it before, but it expresses much more powerfully than I'm able to do the essence of what I've been trying to say. So it's called All People, All Human. I'm telling the people with power that I have power too. If you stifle my voice and deny me a choice, I will show my power to you. I will not come with a weapon. I will not come in fear. I will come with others as sisters and brothers and a voice you will have to hear. I'm telling the people with knowledge that I have knowledge too. If you ignore my words and deny what you've heard, my knowledge will be lost to you. I will not come in anger. I will not come in pain. I will come as me with dignity and your denial will be to your shame. I'm telling the people with control that I have control too. If you put me in chains, then hatred reigns and fear gains control of you. I will not come as a prisoner. I will not come broken to you. I will come with pride and stand by your side because I am human too. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Paul, great. I'm not going to put my camera on because I've been having some problems with uh, with a connection. And I, my deep apologies, particularly to uh, to Ruth for leaving halfway through her introduction. Um, but many thanks for that really inspiring um, lecture and. Um, a huge amount for us to think about both within the network but also as we start thinking about establishing a poverty truth commission um i'd like to invite the audience to put your questions in the in the q a uh, box and i will then moderate those as they as they come in but 
perhaps I can start while people uh, think about questions they'd like to pose. You talked a little bit about the, the politics of, of human rights in the current context. And I, I may have missed this at the beginning when I was out, but I, I suppose in, the, in your two key audiences, we've sometimes struggled to communicate with. One is the politics of rights and political parties and those in government. And I guess struggling to have, to avoid rights being politicized um, in a party political sense. So that's one challenge. The other is, is kind of public engagement of trying to engage with members of the public on everyday issues and often rights being seen as something that affect particular groups or people in faraway places, but not relating to people in, in a city like relatively middle-class city like York. So I just wondered if, I mean, in, in relation to either or both of those challenges, if from your vast experience, there's, I guess any tips in a way you've got for us, any lessons that you've learned about how to engage with those two quite different audiences? Well, I don't have any answers to that. I wish I did. And of course, in terms of politicians, as I, I think you may have missed, I said at the beginning, we, and so we are going backwards because uh, the present government's um, planning to uh, replace the current Human Rights Act with a so-called Bill of Rights. Uh, and I think it's going to be a real struggle. Um, I, I what, what I said at the outset, and I don't know if you heard, but I, I think, it, it, some, as you will be aware, that some human rights theorists uh, place great emphasis on the human in human rights. And I think that might be a way in of trying to, um, and, and, and the emphasis on human dignity um, as a way in of, kind of engaging with people who might be resistant to a rights discourse. Um, and then in a sense, you, you might be having, if you can get them in through that and what it means to be treated with dignity um, and see that everybody is a human being, you know, regardless of uh, the group they're in, then that does seem to me to be um, a, a one way in to um, both actually talking to politicians, but also perhaps to engaging um, members of the public, people who think of human rights as, yeah, for, for other groups, not for them, but emphasizing what it, how it's, it, it helps us see what, what, you know, when you talked about sort of more middle class people, well, it allows them to see what they have in common with groups that perhaps they don't come into con much contact with um, and think of as different. But, um, you know, people in poverty aren't a group apart. Um, many people are put in and out of poverty in any case, but even if they didn't, they are still ultimately human beings um, and they don't have a separate culture as was once, you know, been argued by some academics in the past. So that, that would be, I think, my, I mean, it's not an answer because it's very difficult and I think it's becoming increasingly difficult at the Westminster level to, to talk about rights. But for a long time, in the sense, regardless of which party has been in power, there's been this idea, well, we can't, you know, too much emphasis on rights, not enough on responsibilities, uh, which I don't actually believe is true. Um, but, uh, I think also it, it you know there may be a, quite a bit to learn from Scotland um, how they've done it how you know how they managed to engage people through in a in a sort of human rights approach to social security so I don't know th those are my sort of initial thoughts but I, I don't have any uh, answers I'm afraid. No, that that's great thank you um, the the questions are starting to come in so which is great please keep them coming. Could I just also point out that um, in the chat box, Oliver's put a link to Ruth's book um, uh, with a 20% discount. So I strongly urge you, if you've been inspired by tonight's talk, to, uh, to buy a copy of, of the book. And there's a discount available um, for attendees at the lecture. So there's, there's two questions which address human rights at very different levels. Um, so one from Joe Marriott, who works in housing in Yorkshire, who's asking, 
what practical changes can be made by staff that are working directly with people in poverty. So that's a kind of cold face question. And then there's a, a question at a totally different level from Pete Kilbane saying, thanks for the lecture. But he's got a nagging question that if we accept that poverty is caused by the economic system, can we tackle it without changing the system? Oh, so big questions um, being asked. Um, well, Joe, I, I might. I think my work, what I would suggest is actually involving the people that you're working with and ask them how they, you know, what are the practical ways you can you can make the relations that you have with people in poverty better, make their life better. Um, because I don't think there's a kind of, I mean, in a sense, that's my answer, I suppose, is, is, is involvement of the people with whom you're working. Um, I think in your training, um, I mean, I don't know how big an organisation you, that you work for, but I think it, it's been, been, as I said, towards the end of the lecture, um, involving people with experience of poverty in training professionals, whatever, you know, it mainly happened in social work, but it could just as easily happen in housing, um, helps understand um, the, particularly the relational side of poverty, but also what lack of income does to you. Um, so that, that would be my answer to that. In terms of the, uh, well, I think we, I think we can, there's a lot we can do within the current economic system. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily a system that I like, but um, the last, and I don't want to be party political here, but the last Labour government did show that it's possible to reduce the number of people in poverty, uh, mainly through the social security system, but not entirely because some of it, I mean, politicians all, of all ilks like to say how paid work is the main route out of poverty. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a growing number of people in work in poverty. Um, but it is possible, I think, within, you know, if there's a commitment there, if you've got a clear strategy, if you've got clear goals, and it is possible to at least reduce, I'm not saying, it, I don't think you can abolish poverty within the current system, but we're so far from that, that just to reduce it significantly would be a big achievement. The problem with the last Labour government was it didn't, it kind of, um, it, as I said at the time, it did good by stealth and they didn't really make the case. So it was too easy to unpick a lot of what they'd done. Um, and I do think it's important to try and carry the general population with you. And there was, there was a sense during the pandemic that there was a great, because so many more people had to claim social security, experienced what economic insecurity means, that perhaps public attitudes were, were, would be more conducive to anti-poverty work. It's not clear whether, I mean, it, there is some suggestion that that was perhaps a, a moment, a transitory phase. But I think public attitudes generally over a longer period of time have become a bit more um, open to uh, work because I think there's a recognition. I mean, and particularly now with the cost of living crisis, it's just there is a recognition of the terrible position that so many people are in. It doesn't really answer your question, I realise that, but I think if we wait to change the economic system, then, you know, nothing will happen. So we've got to do what we can within the system that we're in. Thank you. Um, I, I'm conscious we're over time, but we started late. So, um, Ruth, are you okay if we, if we go a few minutes over time? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, I, I'm going to give you another pair of questions, which are again very, very different. Um, so one is from um, Debbie Cobbett, very short question saying, should we focus on tackling poverty or inequality? Um, the second question um, is anonymous and, uh, and is a longer one, so let me read it out. As someone who has lived in poverty, 
a single mother of two trying to better her life by going to the University of York, I've often been dismissed and told that I should put myself, that I put myself in that situation. I've recently been told by housing associations in York that I can't get housing because I'm a student, even though I have kids, basically letting me and my kids become homeless or I don't carry on with my education. This is a huge issue as I can't afford private housing because of my low income. If education is the way to reduce poverty, how can York change this policy or how can I argue this? Ooh. Um, we'll start with that. Um, I mean, I hope that perhaps there's somebody here listening from that has some power in York that might be able to help. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's really a most unfair situation that you've been put in. Um, and is a, I mean, it, it's a horrible example of how you clearly have been doing what you can to get out of poverty using your age i mean what i was talking about using your agency to try and get out of poverty and then decisions are made that kind of throw you back um and you know that you're you're reducing your access to housing and um i i mean this is this is perhaps a kind of thing that the new commission on po um, poverty that's going to poverty truth commission that's going to be set up in York should be looking at because I suspect this is not you're, you're not alone in this. Now I'm I'm sorry I can't sort of come up with an answer immediately, but I would suggest that when the poverty truth commission is set up, that perhaps you you go to them and talk to them and then or and see um, whether they can. Uh, raise raise this issue. Uh, otherwise, I mean, for your student welfare, um, whether they can help, um, but it, it it's a kind of cruel, uh, and and that you're being told that you've put yourself in this position. I mean, when you're trying to you know get out of it, this this seems wrong. But I'm sorry, I I'm really sorry that I can't be of help to you. But I just I just wish you the very best and hope that you can get help locally with that. In terms of David's question, I mean, poverty and inequality are, are different things, but they are inex inextricably linked. And ultimately, I think, and it go, perhaps goes back a bit to the question about the economic system, that there are limits to how far we can reduce poverty if we stay in such an unequal society. And, and the more unequal the society, the, the worse the poverty tends to be. But I don't think it's a kind of either or. Um, I think probably with the current government, it's easier to talk about poverty and push on poverty than it is inequality. Although I do think health inequalities is something that they are kind of, that does resonate. Um, and clearly, the you know, work of people like Sir Michael Marmot shows a relationship between health inequalities and wider inequality and poverty. So I just think we have to, um, well, we have to, we have to argue on both, but um, that, and I and certainly imagine in a, I mean, I don't know enough about York itself, but. I imagine that this would be something that the, the Poverty Truth Commission in York will, will kind of look at poverty in York in the context of the wider social economic structures of York. Uh, and I imagine it's quite an unequal uh, city. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, there are a number more questions coming in, but maybe if we take a final pair, given that time, we're already over time, and then I'll hand over to Alison for a a final thank you. So two final questions, Ruth. First from Amy Blythe, who's interested in the intersection between poverty and children's rights. Are you aware of any particular channel, channels um, whereby children can effectively communicate their experience of living with poverty and their vision for the future? Um, and the second question from Councillor Claire Douglas, 
thanking you for the lecture and asking what you think of the concept of either universal basic income or universal basic services as a route to reducing poverty. Um, for Amy's question, um, I think Wales has been, has particularly looked at um, or has promoted the idea of poverty, at children, child poverty as a children's rights issue. Um, and a number of, I think, the children's rights or children's charities now acknowledge a kind of children's rights perspective and the involvement of children themselves. Um, and I do think it's important. Uh, I, I've been involved in a British Academy uh, project on ch childhood and um, very clear the importance of listening to what children themselves have to say and, and of acknowledging children's rights and particularly the right to participation. So I do think there's a very strong link between um, tackling child poverty and children's rights. And again, this might be something that the, the Poverty Truth Commission here in York will, will take on board. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, universal basic income. Um, I used to be very skeptical about it. I'm rather more um, uh, well disposed towards it now because I do think, and, and this is something that I felt again in my in the first edition of my book, I didn't take enough pay enough attention to is the insecurity associated with poverty. Um, and it's not actually just, I mean, it's wider than people in poverty, but it's more intense, I think, for people in poverty, economic insecurity. And universal basic income, obviously it depends on what level it is and so forth, but it does ensure that you have some income because it's totally unconditional. It's paid on an individual basis. So, you know, say a woman subject to domestic violence, needs to get out, she knows she's got that money. Um, so I think it is certainly consistent with a human rights perspective, um, an individual human rights perspective. Uh, and it's interesting how I think interest in and support for the idea of universal basic income has grown during the pandemic, partly because just the the, the, the sort of economic insecurity that became very clear that um, so many people faced as a result of the pandemic. And it brought home, I think, just how close many people are to the edge without having realized it. So I do think it's worth pursuing, but it's not something that we're going to achieve in the short term, although there are pilots in a number of places now. So it's worth seeing you know what what impact they've had um yeah i'll leave it at that i'm conscious of getting on many thanks um well thank you from me for a wonderfully stimulating talk there's a huge amount for us as a network and for the commission as it sets up to to think about um there was a query in the q a um about the poverty truth commission and oliver's put in the chat a link to that um and actually Alison may want to say some, a little bit about that in her final remarks but um let me hand over now to um Alison Simmons who's the chief exec of York CBS for a final note of thanks yes thank you Paul and thank you to the Baroness Lister for such an inspiring lecture and for answering so many challenging questions I think we could probably have gone on for another couple of hours uh, but I think it just shows the complexity of the issue and the passion and interest we have in York for this for this issue, which is why we are developing a Poverty Truth Commission. So I did put in the chat that we are currently trying to identify community commissioners who will identify the issues that we want to tackle here in York. So we are taking a human rights approach to our Poverty Truth Commission because as the Baroness said, it's much more empowering to talk about entitlement rather than being bestowed with a favour by those in power, which is what currently uh, happens. Um, and I hope that through our Poverty Truth Commission will see people humanised um, which we don't see at the moment, they're treated as statistics and not seen as actual human beings. Um, and I was struck by the words dignity, shame and powerless, which are certainly words we've heard from people um, living in poverty here in York. 
Um, and I don't think it's for people living in poverty to feel shame. I think it's for those of us who have the power to make change to feel shame um, and to take action to to do what we can to eradicate poverty. So hopefully through our Poverty Truth Commission, we can bring together the people with the power, uh, with the people who are living in poverty, um, to address the issues and um, and hopefully make the changes necessary to to alleviate poverty for them and improve on their lives. So thank you again to the Baroness for such an inspiring, thought-provoking lecture, which will remain with us here in York and will give us a good start, I think, for our Poverty Truth Commission. And thank you to everybody else for joining us this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you want to find out more about our Poverty Truth Commission, want to get involved, please look on our website, which is in the chat, uh, and do get in touch to find out more. Thank you.